on Relay 364. When you think about it, this thing exploded. I'm there, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Anybody listen <laughs> about DNA? And now you can't get away from it. The power uh, of this technology when... There are few people in this world who have touched as many people, changed as many lives as Richmond's own Paul Ferrara. Because of his intelligence, his vision, his highly organized brain, many of the world's worst criminals have been caught, kept from raping and murdering again. The innocent have been set free. He changed how we see things. Best wishes, okay? Even the books we read, the shows we watch. You really can blame Paul Ferrara for CSI. You know, for, for all these shows, all these movies, all these books. The sample that we had Dr. Ferrara's orderly mind helped guide us through the treacherous landscape of life and death decisions. A bonds with C. Now, that orderly mind is under attack. Stage four brain cancer has defied surgery and rounds of radiation and chemotherapy. Instead of pondering the joys of retirement and the mysteries of golf, he's having to confront his own mortality. No, I've come to grips with this. I'm, um, I've got a, uh, Everything is taken care of. I've had time to prepare. I've had time to think about it. If you think about it, until now, this guy has led a charmed life, like he was destined to become the catalyst in a forensic science and criminal justice revolution. This organic chemist schooled in Syracuse could have stuck with his nice job in Waynesboro for DuPont. It wasn't much of a sense of satisfaction to be gained there. His orderly mind itched to fight disorder in society. He wanted to use his science to fight crime. And this was an opportunity to get close down to, um, you know, helping investigators. Ferrara came to the state lab in the midst of an avalanche of drug cases. With the tremendous volume of, of contraband drugs that were coming in and had to be analyzed and be prosecuted. Uh, the day we opened our doors of that laboratory, um, we never n did not have a backlog of cases. Thank you. And thank you what you've done for our country. He's one of the sort of the renaissance men of forensic science. Even though he's, his specialty is molecular biology and DNA and things like that, he knows about it all. As scientists began unlocking the secrets of DNA, the building blocks of life, Ferrara recognized genetic fingerprinting's potential as a crime-fighting tool. While controversial at the time, it was such a no-brainer in terms of what it could do from an investigative lead. But he had to sell the complex concept to prosecutors, police, judges, and legislators who had to pass laws to make such a database legal. It's the blueprint, the, the double helix, trying to lay out because in those early terms because DNA was not a common term a, at all. So it took an awful lot of early on explanation, building up, uh, uh, building up confidence in, the, in this revolutionary technology. It was the fall of 1987. Two grown women and a 15-year-old girl raped and strangled to death in their homes in South Richmond or Chesterfield. There was no suspect. Fear gripped the city. Women were scared. Women were very much afraid. Because it was so random and it was so illogical. The strangler was positively identified by a DNA match from a lab in Northern Virginia where he had struck again. Timothy Spencer became Virginia's DNA reliability test case. Essentially, the only evidence they had against Timothy Spencer was DNA evidence at the scene of the three crimes on which I ultimately represented him. I tried to contact people to give me information on it, and at that time, it was, it was literally so new, it was very difficult. That was actually the first serial capital murder DNA case resolved, prosecuted, and e executed. The stunning DNA strangler hit came as Ferrara prepared to ask the Virginia General Assembly to pass a law allowing the establishment of a DNA data bank and for money to fund it. You remember the scene from Ghostbusters uh, when they get their first call and the girl hits the alarm at the, at the firehouse and says, we got one. It was that kind of a situation where phone calls cascaded. Paul obviously calls uh, the, uh, the folks in the General Assembly and lets them know that, uh, you know, that it does work, 
And uh, it wasn't a question of whether it was going to be funded, but are, are you sure this is enough to get you started? Just a trace of DNA. Once we passed those statutes and we started making hits, like in uh, the Debbie Smith case, the word spread and uh, Katie bar the door because uh, we went from there to, for years, the largest DNA data bank in the world. It may not have prevented my rape, but... Among the earlier cases solved by the data bank was the March 1989 rape of Debbie Smith in Williamsburg. She was kidnapped from her home while her husband, a police officer who had worked an overnight shift, was sleeping upstairs. Six years later, a DNA data bank cold hit ended her nightmare. For the first time in six and a half years, I could feel myself breathe again. When Paul came to me and asked me, you know, um, told me what he wanted and what he needed uh, was for somebody to come in and make, um, make people understand the victim side of this, I told him, no, he had the wrong person. So he took me into the evidence room and it just broke my heart. I saw all of these boxes just from floor to ceiling with black numbers on them. And I, I asked him, what is all of this? And he explained to me that these were kits that had never been tested before. And I just, I just couldn't imagine that I could make a difference in that. But I felt like if Paul thought that I could, then I at least had, had to try. Next thing I know, she's up in Congress. She's all over the world. Debbie Smith became the face of a push that has raised hundreds of millions of dollars to try to catch up to the backlog of rape and other violent crime evidence that could solve and prevent countless other crimes. Virginia's data bank may have crashed and might not have spread across the country if it hadn't been immediately seen as impartial. The list of those wrongly accused or convicted who were exonerated by DNA grows every day. For purpose of exclusion, for purpose of saying you are not the one, dead bang on. It's righteous. The very same DNA that nailed Spencer cleared a man who had been locked down for one of the attacks. Under Dr. Ferrara's leadership, Virginia became a world leader of forensic science. I would say that Paul has changed the world, not just changed lives. He's changed forensic science in the world. He's changed people. He certainly has changed me. Those whose lives have been touched by Paul Ferrara are deeply moved by the fact that he now could lose his own life. And it just breaks my heart to even think about it. I am sure that someday, 20 years from now, 25 years, 30 years from now, some person will be cleared or some crime will be solved or somebody who is terrorizing the public will be taken off the street. And they really should mention Paul's name. I'm blessed. I've been very, very uh, blessed in just, you know, being having opportunities to, you know, to have a raise a wonderful family, to have a wonderful career, a wonderful wife. You know, 68. Hey, yep, that's okay. I, I did good, I think. <laughs> After all said and done.